it just totally screwed the whole computer up. So I had to give it up. I don't know, probably my technology skills, which are non-existent. Um, <clears throat> is there a good time? So what time on Sunday? Okay. So welcome to our uh, Canandaigua Lake Trout Unlimited intro to fly fishing class um, on May the 11th here. And uh, hopefully you'll get a lot out of it. This is a very exciting uh, sport for me. And uh, this is a, one of the better action shots I have of myself fly fishing. Um, this was a nice uh, big brown trout I caught in uh, Long Island, the Connecticut River in the south shore of Long Island. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we're going to do tonight is um, talk about how fly fishing is different from bait or spin casting, which if you know your traditional uh, type of fishing, um, how it's different from that and the different components of uh, the fly fishing um, rig there, the rod, the fly line, the leaders, and uh, there'll be a lot of jargon, new terms I'll throw out here tonight. Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, knot tying animation and um, show you the uh, basics of the cast. I got uh, some videos uh, teed up on that and we'll talk about what kind of fish you can catch locally fly fishing and originally I did this presentation for the Victor Parks and Recreation Department um, in October of 2019 so it was kind of geared towards uh, Ontario County and uh, where we can fish you know here in the Rochester Ontario County area and what kind of fish you can catch fly fishing um, and where to go and time permitting um, you can, we'll just keep an eye on how long we're going here and uh, may run out of time as we get down to this where to fish, but we'll uh, try and move it along, ask a lot of questions. And um, then we'll talk a little bit what TU is and what our mission is. And then uh, the second part of it is we'll get together and do some fishing. John and I have actually uh, have gone out several times and uh, we'll show some of the rivers we've learn to fish and John is fairly new to fly fishing too. So, um, um, mm -hmm. okay, so what's different about, um, usually if you've done conventional fishing, you've probably had a, a rod and a reel that looked like one of these two on the top, either a, a bait casting or a spin casting rod. And it depends if, you, if the reel was on top of the rod, that was a bait caster. And if it was, if the reel was underneath the rod, you were probably spinning. And um, both of them work the same way. The, uh, when you make a cast, the uh, weight of your bait or your lure is what uh, propels the cast forward. Um, now fly fishing, the difference is, is that the bait, if you will, that you're throwing is very lightweight. So you actually use the weight of the fly line is what propels your cast. The, the, fly itself is usually too light that um, you can't actually cast it. In fact, if you were to put a fly on a bait or spin casting rod, it's pretty much impossible to cast it because it's too lightweight. On the other side, if you put a, uh, a spinning bait or even a, a, like a hook with a worm on it, that's too heavy to fly cast. It just throws the whole thing off and it just does not work. So that's uh, uh, another big difference. And then the type of reel that you use. Uh, spinning reels are, uh, can be pretty complicated. They got a lot of ball bearings and gears and moving parts and, and, um, and they're pretty critical to, uh, to the whole fishing experience. Whereas on the, when you're fly fishing, the reel is actually the least important uh, piece of gear that you have. And it's a very simple, you'll see when you see pictures of it, it's just a real simple disc. And the main purpose of a fly reel is just to hold the line while you're you're casting. And sometimes you don't even reel the line in, you just pull it in by hand. And uh, when you do that, when you retrieve your fly line uh, with your hand, we call that stripping. So sometimes when we fish, if you hear me go strip, 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 that leave your clothes on, that just means uh, pull the line in <laughs> by, your, by your hand there. And then a lot of times when you're, uh, you're learning to fish and, and um, uh, you often use live bait. You might use worms or minnows or crayfish or you know some 
something live, whereas you uh, typically you generally do not do that with uh, fly fishing. In fact, uh, even like a, a worm is too heavy to fly cast. Sometimes to help people maybe get the feel of what it feels like to catch a fish, uh, you'll put a little piece of a worm on the end of a on a fly just so the fish will grab it and people will get the sensation. But uh, generally speaking, you never use uh, live bait when you fly fish. It's always artificial flies. And we'll show you what flies look like further down the road here. Okay, um, so what does a fly rod um, look like? So um, they're, uh, one of the other differences is they tend to, they're much longer than a typical uh, uh, spinning rod. They're uh, usually between seven to ten feet long. Uh, and you can see they're very kind of long and uh, slender looking. Uh, they're usually, these days, most modern rods are made out of graphite. Um, there are fiberglass is still used. Uh, there's some rod makers who make really good fiberglass rods. That was one of the first uh, kind of synthetic materials. And uh, originally fly rods were made out of uh, split bamboo. And um, and those are still on uh, the market. They tend to be very expensive and they're real works of art if you get a, a bamboo rod, they're, they're just beautiful. Um, and uh, so that was the original material and some people uh, like to have one just to be kind of a traditionalist. And if you notice the, uh, the layout of the, the, the reel is at the very end of the rod. It's kind of screwed in um, down on the bottom here. And then you can see you have a uh, cork grips and that's what you hold on to as you cast and, and fish. And rods are described, uh, there's action to them and it all is based on where the rod uh, what does what's called load or bend. And if you look at this um, diagram here, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll describe a rod as either fast or medium or slow. And all that means is uh, where the, the rod bends. Um, the, they call it the blank, the, the, this kind of big long black piece of it, that's called the rod's blank. And um, it tapers down to a really fine tip. And um, when you uh, bend the rod, a, a, what they call a slow rod bends uh, about halfway in the middle there. You'll actually see the arc of the rod will be farther down. And uh, conversely, a faster rod uh, bends more towards the tip here. Can you see my cursor okay as I'm moving it around? I'm gonna have it under the way. Yep. Okay, so a fast rod a, uh, bends ask, there and, and slow further down. Go ahead. Can I ask a question? How do you decide, um, how do you decide how long the rod should be? Seven feet, 10 feet, that's a lot of difference in length. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's uh, where you're fishing. Uh, if you're in a situation where it's like you're in like underbrush and you're surrounded by bushes and trees and, and, uh, and so forth, you might use a shorter rod. Um, generally, all the ones I have are about nine feet long. That's kind of a very typical um, length. And uh, it's kind of the application that you're doing. And uh, once you get into it, you'll, you know, it's kind of like golf. You end up collecting uh, many rods <laughs> and um, for different applications of it. And there's some very long rods, these ones called spay rods um, that are even longer. They're up to 15 feet long. And you actually use uh, both your hands to cast those. You, um, and spay is a river, the spay river is in Scotland and it was a traditional way to fish for Atlantic salmon in Scotland was doing what's called a spay cast and a spay type of rod. Um, so um, now the terms fast and slow uh, doesn't mean uh, you know good and bad either. Uh, you know you would think oh slow sounds I don't want a slow rod I want a fast rod. Well it depends on kind of how you're fishing and where you're fishing. Um, different materials have different flex too like bamboo is uh, considered a very slow material so a bamboo rod flexes almost the entire rod. Um, it really depends if you're how long you need to cast and um, if you need to make a really lengthy cast fast rods can be better but if you need a more delicate presentation you're on a smaller stream and with a lighter rod uh, slower is actually better. So when you're shopping for a new rod and you're a beginner 
generally the best thing is go right in the middle. Just get something that's what's called a medium action. Um, slower rods are a little more forgiving and easier to cast and faster rods are, will cast further. So, um, but when you're starting off, uh, most of the time the recommendation is kind of start, go in the middle there until you kind of figure out what you're doing. How about when children start? I mean, do they all start with the same thing? Or yeah, you something? might, uh, depending on how their age, uh, they may go with a little shorter rod. That's another consideration too. Like a you know, young child, you might give them a, a seven foot rod. Um, they're very, they're very, I've never seen one shorter than seven feet though. Or seven and a half feet is the shortest one I have. Um, Thanks. Okay. Now there are many different kinds of rods um, and depending on the species of fish that you're going for, uh, they're very lightweight rods and they're very heavy ones. And the, what makes them heavy or light is the thickness of the, uh, the, the blank and they're physically heavier. So you describe fly rods in terms of uh, it, uh, something called its weight. And um, so, and the bigger the number, the heavier duty the rod is. And as you can see by this chart um, here, the, um, you can catch literally anything that swims uh, fly fishing from really little, uh, you know, sunfish and tiny fish all the way up to uh, things like, you know, marlins and sailfish and tuna. Um, so these, um, you can see all these. So a one weight is like the smallest and is kind of not really a serious, it's more of a kind of a toy. <clears throat> Generally, the smallest rods people will use might be a three weight, which is used in like a little small stream for very small, small fish. Um, the most popular size is the five, and I, that's what I would recommend anyone getting started with is to get a five weight, and that's why I put its picture here. And that's a good all around rod for small fish, and then you, it will also handle a kind of medium size, um, you know, pretty good size. Uh, you know, maybe up to a couple of pounds where the fish you can easily handle with a five weight. Now, as you start to get into this and start to want to catch bigger and bigger fish, that's where you might start to get um, larger rods. And um, around here, kind of a good rule of thumb is um, if you were to buy only two rods, uh, get a five weight for kind of small fish and trout fishing in streams and get an eight weight for bigger, the bigger fish that you get on the uh, tributaries of, of Lake Ontario. Um, so um, now personally, let's see, how many fly rods do I have? I have a four, that's a, a seven and a half foot four weight that I use for tiny, like I said, kind of compact things. Um, I have three five weights. <laughs> so those are the ones I teach people with. So uh, sat on Sunday, that's what, I'll be uh, giving you as one of my five weights to play with. Uh, I also have a six weight, which I like to use for bass fishing. Um, I have a, one of my nicest rods is a seven weight and um, I use that for uh, steelhead and brown trout in, uh, out of Lake Ontario. Um, John, I actually sold you, or you won my eight weight in a raffle, so I don't have mm -hmm. one of those anymore. <laughs> so sorry, uh, that's all right. I don't need it. I have uh, sorry, not sorry, right? <laughs> you donated it. <laughs> I did donate it. Yeah, I had so many of them I could afford, and I wasn't using it at all. So, and then I have two nine weight rods, uh, which are I use in um, not so much as since I moved up here. I used to use them a lot in salt water. Um, oh, I lived okay. in Long Island, and um, and. Yeah. Um, on Cape Cod for uh, striped bass and bluefish and, and those fish. So I'll use them here for uh, pike. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and then uh, you get into the really big game. I don't have any of these uh, big rods, uh, like the 10s, 11s, and 12s there. Um, usually if I'm going for that kind of fish, I would like charter, a, you know, go out in a charter boat and use the guides uh, equipment so what um, would you use for the lake trout derby if you're going to do that like a nine you know something for like uh, a lake trout um probably not even that heavy you know an eight or even eight. a seven they don't get that huge um so um but uh, yeah because so generally speaking um this is one of those things too the more you get in the sport the more stuff you feel like you have and 
one of the old jokes is, you know, a fly fisherman has to get eventually every weight and then he'll start over and start getting a second one of every weight just to have a spare. And uh, so um, you can yeah. get a little crazy <laughs> with, uh, with this. But the simple thing is I would start with a five or a six. And then um, if you really get into it, and especially if you want to catch bigger fish, then get uh, maybe a little heavier one. Um, Okay, any questions about uh, weights, five weights? And, and I'll actually bring a couple of different rods on Sunday, especially so you can see what the difference between like a nine weight and a five weight is. And you'll see it in the diameter and just the feel of it. it will Super. Be heavier. Yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, so that's uh, the different kinds of um, sizes of rods. It's kind of like golf, except, you know, where you got all the different size clubs for different situations. The one difference is generally though, you don't take a whole bag of uh, fly rods with you. You might take one or usually just take one with you. And if you're on a boat, maybe two. But... Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now the, uh, the partner of the fly rod that makes the whole cast work is the fly line. And uh, since you're casting the weight of the line, having the, the line balanced with the fly rod is, is real important for the cast to work. And so when you buy a fly line, a lot of times you'll buy like a kind of a, a complete outfit. Um, and you'll see a lot of references to Orvis. They're um, a big sponsor of, of our club and for TU in general. So uh, I'm kind of promoting their gear, but... Um, so if you were to uh, buy, uh, Orvis would sell you actually the whole thing, the rod, the line, the reel, you know, everything, um, you know, that gets you set with the, uh, the rod and it'll all be uh, balanced correctly. And fly lines are sold in weights also. So if you have a five weight rod, you would buy five weight line um, as a general rule of thumb. Because if your line is too heavy, it just will not cast right at all. If it's too light, it won't either. It just doesn't uh, do what's called load correctly. So uh, getting that balance is, is key. Now fly lines um, are uh, real colorful looking. You'll see in a lot of the pictures, you know, they're kind of yellows and blues and, and things. So it's not like a spinning line, which is clear as a monofilament. Um, typical fishing line. So fly lines are made out of, uh, the core of it is Dacron and uh, it's a Dacron heavy thread and then it's coated with plastics. And, um, and this uh, illustration is kind of, um, they tend to be fatter in, the, in what's called weight forward. So if you look at it, you can actually feel this with your fingers um, where the front end of it, the forward end will be uh, thicker and then it'll uh, kind of decrease in diameter. And then the end of it is what's called running line. So this belly of the fly line is, that's actually the part you cast, is that kind of that fatter, heavier uh, uh, part of the line. And then all together, like I said, they're about 70 to 90 feet long. Um, and most of the time you will use uh, what's called a weight forward taper. And that's the easiest one to cast. And so, um, some of these others are more specialized. The double taper is kind of an old, um, the whole point of that is it was actually, you could kind of flip it over because they the lines will kind of tend to get worn out in the front end so you can reverse it. That's the logic between double tapers, but they're harder to cast. And so I don't, I've never used one. And uh, some of these other ones, um, if you're getting into bigger uh, flies like you would use in saltwater, uh, this uh, belly gets more pronounced. It's uh, what's called a, a shooting head. Um, it's actually more weight and it's designed to be cast longer, further cast. Um, most of your um, lines, when you start off, you buy uh, what's called a floating line. It floats on the surface of the water. And, um, and that's what you typically use uh, when you're trout fishing or bass fishing. Uh, for the most part, but if you fish in uh, like uh, in the Finger Lakes where there where it's deeper water or in salt water, uh, you might uh, go to what's called a sinking line, which uh, literally does that. When you cast it, it lands on the water and, and sinks underwater. And there's they come in different uh, weights, and some lines sink. Uh, they actually have a kind of a grading of how fast or slow they sink. 
Um, one I like to use is a, is a intermediate sinking, which is kind of a slower sinking line. And I will do that so to get my fly down to about 10 feet uh, in water. Uh, a full sinking line uh, will get you down to about 30 or so feet. So um, there is a limitation with fly fishing as to how deep uh, you can realistically get the fly to, to catch fish. So, um, uh, and it tends to be, I think about 30 or 40 feet. Um, once you're in much deeper water than that, uh, then you kind of have to go back to um, using a, a bait casting rod or something heavy to, to get into those deeper depths. For example, in the Finger Lakes, which are very deep, uh, a lot of times lake trout are in like 100 feet of water or 70 or 80 feet of water. So pretty difficult to fly fish uh, for fish in that deep of water. But um, the um, so that's what a, what a fly line looks like. And uh, it and the rod, like I said, are like partners. They're the two important things for the cast to work. And in back of the fly line, you have what's called backing. And all of that is, is it's another oh, couple of hundred feet of just Dacron um, uh, line. A uh, real heavy, uh, strong, uh, like 30 or 40 pound test uh, Dacron line. And uh, you use the backing uh, comes in handy if you get a, a really large fish that does what's called goes on a run, where basically the fish decides he's, he's gone, he's swimming away from you. Um, especially steelhead trout will uh, pull your entire fly line out of the reel and you'll be into your backing. And, I've, and if it gets to 300 feet, it'll probably break. <laughs> so if it's a fish that big. Um, so, um, and we'll show you kind of what backing and, and uh, and the fly line looks like. And so that's what, uh, and then the important thing is to uh, get the same weight line as your rod is. Okay, any questions on fly lines? Mm -hmm. So um, now, so you've got your rod and you've got your line, which is what you're casting. Now attached to the end of the fly line uh, the fly lines, as you can see, are, you know, colorful. They're like bright. And that's a lot of times to help you see them. So you might have a, you know, like a yellow or an orange fly line, but that would spook the fish. So you actually connect your um, fly to uh, the end of a very clear uh, leader. And uh, so the leader is tied to the end of your fly line. And um, that's usually about seven to 12 feet long, depending on how you're fishing, what you're fishing for and so forth. And then the very end of the leader, final foot or two is called a tippet. And it's really just the end section of the uh, leader. And um, the other thing about the leader, if you see for the illustration, it's tapered, it's thicker at the, uh, what's called the butt end by the uh, fly line and it gets thinner. Um, as it gets down towards the tip. And that helps the, um, the fly to do what's called turnover when you cast, that taper is important for the, uh, the cast to work right. Um, and leaders are made out of two materials or either uh, nylon monofilament, which is like your regular fishing line, um, or it might be uh, another type called fluorocarbon, which is a, uh, another clear line, but it's a uh, slightly different uh, uh, chemical or whatever. Fluorocarbon is more expensive than nylon, but fluorocarbon is more transparent in the water. It's virtually in invisible when, uh, so that's a real advantage to, uh, to it, but it is a little more costly than, uh, than nylon. And um, Let's see, sometimes uh, most of the leaders you buy in a pack, like you see here, they usually come two to a pack and they'll s tell you how long the leaders are. Nine feet is, is a very typical length. Um, and, um, and you get it and you unloop it. And, uh, and usually you connect it. In the old days, you had to tie a real specialized knot to the fly line and the leader. Now they come with loops on both ends. So they're real easy to connect. And so most of your leaders will have a loop on it to connect to the fly line. And um, now the interesting then tippets, um, which is this end piece, the, uh, they come in different diameters and weights. And, um, and it really is um, 
goes from and depends on on the size of the fly that you're using and and how you know what you're fishing for and um and the interesting thing about the tippet scale it's the opposite of the uh the fly line or the fly rod scale the weight so on the the fly line the fly rod weight uh the bigger the number the heavier the rod with tippets it's the opposite the uh bigger the number the lighter the tippet so a 7x tippet is only like two pound test very fine uh really really it's almost like spider web uh diameter i'm not a big fan of using it just because it's hard to see to tie <laughs> tie knots um and then for heavier ones you may get up into these uh you know what they call zero x 13 pound or 10 pound test the one i use most often is usually uh right in the middle here uh usually uh three x or four x which is about 10 to six pound test uh for the fishing i do and if it's really smaller flies i may go down to the fives or sixes i don't like us to go much smaller than that i think eight x is the the tiniest one and um it, it's really a pain to work on. It's just hard to tie a knot in it. <laughs> and as those of us get to us, I think all of us wear glasses I'm seeing here. So uh, tying knots on this real fine uh, tippet can be fun. Um, the other thing about leaders and tippets, if you notice there's a little knot here. And um, what will happen as you start to change flies, you, you snip off about, you know, you lose a few inches of tippet every time you, um, change a fly or you break a fly or you know you donate a lot of flies to uh, trees and bushes and rocks <laughs> so you will lose a, a, a certain number of them and so as you change flies your tippet gets shorter and shorter and eventually you have to tie on a new piece and um, so there's a, either a special knot you use to tie the leader to the tippet or um, nowadays I, I bought um, they're called tippet rings and it's a little tiny uh, steel ring that you tie to both ends of it and, and it makes it a lot easier to uh, to tie the tippet on you just tie it to this little little bitty ring and um and normally the tippet section that gets is the one that gets the most gets beat up it gets uh frayed and twisted and you'll get knots in it and and stuff so that uh, you'll tend to change off and the leaders will last quite a while as long as you don't um you know, get too much abrasion in it um, or things like that. So usually a leader will last me all season, but tippet is something that, you know, I change constantly as I fish. Do you need to keep the tippet and the leader um, weights the same? No, um, and that's a good question. Um, depending on, the main key is, is the size of the fly you're using. So a little tiny fly, you would want to use these fine tippets. And then let's say you're not catching anything with those. So you want to put a bigger streamer fly on, then you would cut off your light tippet and tie on a heavier one. So leaders will usually come like these packs, like this one's a five X. Yeah. Um, so you probably, you wouldn't do anything bigger than, than that. That would kind of throw the cast off. So often I will buy like three X or four X leaders. And then I have different, smaller tippets if I need. Got it. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, and the size of it, it really depends. Uh, like if you're doing uh, really fishing for big fish, um, you know, let's say in salt water where you're using a nine weight rod, you would, you'd be using these heavier leaders and tippets because um, you also need the, the knot, you know, the, the, the right. strength. Yeah. Cause you're <clears throat> fishing for big, active, strong fish. So. And when your tippet gets shorter and shorter, when is a good time to replace it like it? Because I think it's usually what, like a three foot section or something? Yeah, it depends. It, <clears throat> um, and that's also, there's, there's a kind of a science the, and people have different opinions on how long your, your whole tippet and leader should be. I usually, since the rod is nine feet, that's a good gauge. I like the leader and the tippet to be nine feet too. <clears throat> Because you don't want to pull the um, the leader into the into the uh, the rod guides at the tip. You want yeah, to be outside. Yeah, yeah, you could actually break the tip of the rod off very easily doing that. So, um, um, 
And what usually the rule of thumb is if you're fishing on the, for dry flies on the surface where you need to have more stealth, um, a longer leader and tippet would be used. If you're fishing underwater with a streamer, you might use something shorter, maybe uh, even as short as five or six feet. Um, so it depends. You'll hear me say that word a lot tonight. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so that's a... Uh, leaders and then the last piece of equipment is the reel and you can see it's a real simple looking thing it's really just a disc that revolves around this axle so it's um and uh, you know a simple handle and it is the depending on it really the reel really doesn't become important until you're you get bigger fish um, a lot of times when you're catching small fish you know especially you will be learning how to catch sunfish and and then small trout, um, uh, you, don't, you don't even have to reel them in. You can just uh, pull the line and uh, strip in the, the fly line. And uh, then you just kind of use the reel to kind of adjust how much uh, fly line you have out. You kind of uncrank it or crank it in. Um, but a lot of mistakes that people automatically, if they're used to conventional fishing, as soon as they get the line out, they want to reel it in. But you manipulate the fly line more with your hands, actually, than you do with the, uh, the reel. So uh, that's why I put it at the end here. The reel is uh, really the least important piece of equipment um, until you get to the point if you're fishing for, for bigger fish. Um, and then um, the, uh, what's called the drag system in the reel becomes important. That's like the brakes to uh, kind of slow a, a large fish down. Um, so you tighten the drag on, on that. So if you are doing, um, uh, get into some of these bigger uh, fish, we have some of the uh, salmon and, and uh, steelhead and, and stuff from Lake Ontario, the drag becomes important then because they're very strong fish. But for the average trout or even bass, uh, generally you don't have to fuss around with, um, with uh, too fancy of a reel. Reels can get expensive too. Uh, you can spend, um, you know, five or six hundred dollars, depending on how um, fancy they are in reels. But a real simple one, um, you know, can be less than a hundred dollars. So, um, and then uh, the what they call the arbor—that's basically the diameter of the reel. And this is kind of a typical uh, trout reel here, and this one uh, here. These two look like they're a little larger diameter. They call that the arbor, the large the arbor of the reel. Um, this thing called the multiplier, I've never actually seen one. I think that's kind of an older, it looks like something you'd use maybe in salt water. It has like a gear in it. That's why they call it that. You can see like, so it's um, meant to uh, be able to reel the line in quicker. Um, you'll find too, if you're used to conventional uh, fishing reels that these uh, reeling in the line is a little slower because you don't have the, all these, uh, you know, gears and things to multiply the, um, the end there, it just kind of spins and spins. And, <laughs> and usually also uh, typically, um, there's some argument about this. Let's go up to the, the picture of the fly rods here. But um, normally uh, if you're right-handed, uh, you put the handle of the reel on the left side. So you cast with your right hand and you reel with your left. Similar to if you've used the spinning reel and rod and reel. Uh, some people like to do everything with their right hand, so <clears throat> you know, they'll want the real handle on the right. Um, that's fine. You can adjust them. They can be flipped around. But uh, usually this would be kind of a right-handed setup here where the, uh, the real handle is on the left, so you would uh, reel with your left hand. So that's a fly reel. And that's good. <clears throat> okay. And then, then here's some other doodads that uh, you, you want. You can, uh, a lot of times too, you'll find you, you go to a, a shop and you end up buying more little gadgets and stuff. But uh, the important thing, the most important thing is to have polarized sunglasses. The polarization allows you to see into the water. It removes the glare from the surface of the water. And so polarized sunglasses make uh, is what turns uh, 
Clark Kent into Superman. You can all of a sudden you can see fish uh, under the water, um, and it's funny. You take your glasses off, you just see you know the glare on the top of the water. But you put polarized glasses on, and you can actually see the fish swimming under the water. So it's good to be able to spot fish. And it's important to uh, protect your eyes from the uh, the glare off the surface of the water on especially a sunny day. So I wear polarized glasses even if I'm fishing on a cloudy day, uh, just because of the way it helps you uh, see underwater. Um, and um, you know, depending on um, you know if you need uh, you know prescriptions or whatever, you can spend a lot for prescription polarized glasses. Um, if you don't need uh, prescription glasses, you can buy inexpensive ones from you know CVS. Um, but it's important to have glasses. It also protects your eyes in case a uh, errant cast uh, comes flying into your face and you don't get a uh, hook in your eye. So it's important to have that eye protection. Same reason you want to wear a hat when you fish uh, in case, uh, I mean, I've done this before where you'll uh, be fly casting, the wind will uh, drift the cast and you know hook the back of your head. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so. <laughs> So having a hat is important and uh, also to protect yourself from the glare and things. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, if a lot of times the best fishing is in the worst weather. So you want a good foul weather gear and you also want it in kind of muted colors. You don't want anything real bright or, you know, nothing, uh, no psychedelic or fluorescent uh, bright colors because fish will see that they have extraordinary eyesight. And so you want like this jacket here is, you know, kind of a, a brown, mine's, a, a gray. Um, so you don't tend to want flashy colors when you fish. <clears throat> One thing I wear because um, I'm susceptible to sunburn is um, these real lightweight gloves, Orvis uh, sells these and they're like uh, polyester and there's nothing, they're not warm at all, but they're designed to protect your hands from uh, getting sunburned. And that's one of the real risks of fishing is it's real easy to burn the heck out of your um, your hands because you're um, a lot of times they're getting wet. Uh, so if you put sunscreen on them, that gets washed off. Um, you actually have to be careful with sunscreen and um, and bug spray that you don't get that um, the residue from that on your fly because fish will smell that and it'll turn them off and they won't bite if uh, you know the fly smells like copper tone or off or <laughs> something. So. Uh, so uh, I, I really swear by uh, by my gloves. It's kind of the holy grail too, is finding nice ones. Uh, um, I went fishing last Friday, which was pretty cold. It was in the 40s and the gloves I had got wet and I made the mistake of not bringing a, a spare uh, pair of them with me. And so I had uh, like uh, pretty you know cold and cramped hands. It wasn't that pleasant. And um, because you're using your hands so much to manipulate the uh, especially the, the fly line, uh, when you get the, your hands start cramping up, uh, it really uh, affects your ability to fish well. Um, so I like the different um, fingerless gloves here. You don't have to buy special gloves. If you ride a bike, um, you know, those bicycle gloves actually work the same way. Something with just where your fingers are, are free. Um, and then the other kind of necessity is a pair of forceps. That's to help uh, get the hook out of the fish mouth. If a fish uh, swallows your fly, takes it kind of deep into its mouth, you use these like a surgeon to uh, unhook them. And, uh, and you use it for you know, some other uh, little tools, but a, a forceps is uh, real important. And um, the nippers, you can actually use a nail clipper just as well as that, but that's to uh, cut your line as you're trimming. Um, if you tie on a new, um, a new bug and you have to, um, to trim it off, uh, some kind of a, a nipping device. Uh, now, once you uh, start fishing uh, in streams, um, especially uh, you get older um, and you got to watch your balance, it's real good idea to have a, a, a weighting staff. This one's kind of a fancy one they're showing. It actually folds up. That's what all these bends are. Um, if you have an old ski pole, that makes an excellent uh, weighting staff. Just take the basket off the bottom of a ski pole and, and you've got a perfect uh, waiting staff. Or even if you forget one, just find a stick at the side of the stream or something. Uh, but if you're, if, once you do uh, start waiting, you have to, it's something you have to really uh, be careful with because um, you're, um, 
uh, falling down while you're waiting is no fun. A lot of times these streams are cold. Um, you can injure yourself. Uh, you know, you, I've known people that break wrists or injure their knees or things falling down because you're waiting on, you know, a slippery bottom. There's slippery rocks and mud and, and so forth. So uh, having some kind of a, uh, a staff to help you um, wait is important. Waiting belt, that means that's something you tie around the waders. If you do fall down, you don't want water going inside your waders. So that's what that's designed for. And, um, and finally, uh, make sure you have a fishing license. Uh, you do need, it's uh, inexpensive. Uh, you can get it online now. Uh, a, a yearly license is uh, $25 in New York. Um, so, and, and if you don't want, that's for the whole season. If you don't want to, uh, you know, if you just want it for a week, I think it's less than 10 bucks or something. So they're very inexpensive. So um, I've never been checked for a fishing license, but probably about the time I didn't forgot to bring it would be the time I'll, I would get caught. And it's not a big, you know, but still it's a fine and you don't want to have to do that. And then it supports uh, the conservation efforts in, in the uh, state. Um, so here's some other stuff. Like I said, you can end up going a little crazy with some of the stuff you buy. And um, um, so a lot of times the, this is the, instead of carrying a tackle box, cause a lot of times you're walking around and especially if you're waiting, you end up wearing your tackle box, if you will. So uh, traditionally uh, you would have a vest, um, which I will, I have one that looks almost exactly like this one, you know, with lots of pockets to put all your, your different uh, stuff in. And um, usually your flies are coming in, in a box like this here. So uh, you'll have those different pockets that you put your flies and the, the tools and, and so forth. Uh, there are other ones, this one kind of hangs over your, your chest and in the front. And this one's a backpack that you wear in the back. Here's kind of a fanny pack deal. And uh, this one's kind of a sling. This is sort of the holy grail too, is what do you, use to carry your stuff around. A real minimalist approach is this lanyard. Basically everything you need, you just put over your neck. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, the mistakes you'll tend to make is you, you'll load like everything you own into your vest. And the more stuff you have in it, the more it weighs. And over the course of a day, that weight on your back and your shoulders and neck and everything will start to, you'll start to double over and feel it you know, if you've been out a while. So um, it's important just to bring the stuff you need for that fishing trip. Don't bring every fly you you own because you're not gonna need your saltwater flies if you're going uh, trout fishing and and so forth. Uh, and then um, once you in, in are wanna start uh, stream fishing and, and wading, uh, and then that's when you buy um, a pair of waders and uh, they come in kind of two flavors, uh, what's called uh, uh, boot footed or stocking footed. And the difference is, is the uh, most waders uh, that you're used to, the, the boot of the waiter is, is kind of built into it, kind of molded into it. It's like a rubber boot. But there are other ones that are called stocking footed where you have, uh, uh, basically it's neoprene on the bottom of the wader and then you put a uh, wading boot on. It looks like a big hiking boot. And um, if you're going to be walking any distance, because uh, you do do a lot of hiking a lot of times when you fish. Uh, so you these uh, separate boot and waders uh, generally are more supportive. And, um, and the waders are kind of one of those things you get what you pay for, but it also depends how much you're going to use them. Uh, like. My friend I was out fishing with, who's a, a professional guide the other day, he fishes almost every day. So he goes through a pair of waders every season. Uh, whereas I have had the same ones for about 10 years. Um, so these are some of the accessories. You don't need to buy a lot of stuff. And if you have just kind of a shoulder bag, um, you know, some sort, that's, a, that's fine and dandy. I actually have one I got as a freebie from some um, outfit I donated money to. And I use that as a perfectly nice uh, little bag to hold things in. I also have clothing. I have shirts that have big pockets uh, that I'll uh, use. And uh, so the longer I do this, actually the less I like to carry a lot of stuff around and I'll just uh, put a couple of boxes of flies in the, in the 
tools I need. And um, uh, these one shirts, a company called Bimini Bay, and it's got all these big pockets and loops and tabs and things I can hook things onto. So, so this is some of the other stuff that you can get. And, and once you get into it, people will start giving you this stuff as presents, probably, right? Or gift cards or, or things as once. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time on knots, um, but um, the thing with them is all there's there's all oh, probably hundreds of different knots you can learn how to to tie, but you only need a, about two or three basic ones, and um, this one um, called the improved clinch knot is kind of the basic one that you use to tie your fly uh, to your um, to your tippet. And, uh, and this also used uh, for all sorts of uh, other fishing, you know, any other fishing we have to tie a, a hook onto a line. Um, I like this one called the uh, mono knot, which is pretty easy to tie. And um, but like I said, you can go a little crazy with the knots. Um, let me go into this web real quickly and I'll show you how this works. And this animation is kind of neat. Let me know when, if that screen comes up. Uh, are you still seeing the PowerPoint or are you seeing animated knots? PowerPoint. Okay, let me stop that. And <coughs> share this screen. Now you see something called animated knots. Everything's online and high tech these days, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, um, and you see all these uh, different knots. So let's uh, look at this one real easy. The skip the ads here. There it goes. So you put it through the eye of the hook, twist it around all um, well, about half a dozen times. This is called the tag end, the end of the line, and you kind of loop it around and, and pull it through there. And you also, when you tie a knot, you do so you want to kind of moisten it, um, get some uh, saliva on the knot that helps lubricate the, um, the uh, tippet and uh, makes the knot uh, seat tighter. Usually if you lose a fish, it isn't because the fish broke your connection, it's usually because your knot came unraveled. Um, so um, knowing how to tie a knot, and everyone will go through that where they'll have a knot unravel, uh, but that's, uh, that's part of the game. So that's a real important one that's easy to tie. And then uh, I'll do one other knot here. And that's this one called the, um, it has a kind of a big name, mono slip, something or other, um, loop knot. I like this one because this loop makes the fly uh, swim more naturally. So it's a, you start with an overhand knot, you put the tag through that twist it around a few times and then put the tag back through the overhand and then tighten it all down. And what's nice about this, it's actually very strong. It's maybe even stronger than the first knot, but because of that loop, the fly uh, swims around easier. It's not uh, as tightly tied to the tippet. So I like that one. Um, so I'll send this link out with the knots here and you can, uh, the other thing is if you go fishing with a, a guide or something, they usually do the knot tying for you. So <laughs> that's... Okay, we'll bring back our uh, our deck here. I'll have to practice that one. I've done the uh, the first one you did is the one I tie usually. The clinch, yeah, that's an easy one. That, and if you're used yeah. to conventional fishing, you probably tied that one on uh, using a lure or, or a hook before. And it's much easier using uh, when you're practicing using much thicker line than you are going to use out in the field. So. Yes. <laughs> a good point. Yeah, you're not using this looks like clothesline they're using or something. But uh, yeah, I especially you get those light tippets, you know, that 7x. Need my tippets. magnifiers. Yeah. Yeah, I have to, I have like bifocal transition glasses. <laughs> and, um, they, they sell little magnifiers, uh, you know, and so that's, you can always tell the age of a fisherman by how many. Uh, I have those, they clip <laughs> on my baseball cap. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so those are, are some knots. 
And then here's our, our finally we're over, how do you cast uh, a fly rod? So it's basically, you probably, if you've seen pictures of it, you've seen, you know, they're kind of waving the rod back and forth and um, it looks very, uh, you know, elegant and, and things. So, but there's two pieces to the cast and that's the, uh, the back cast and the forward cast. And the, uh, the back cast, just like it says, the fisherman, you're, that's when you're throwing the line in back of you. And the real important part of that is that that's doing what's called loading the rod, which is basically putting a bend in the rod. It's like a, a bow and arrow there. And so you let the, you, you, the back cast load the rod and then you go forward and, um, and stop the cast. And then the momentum of the line will carry your fly to your target. So that's here again, you're casting the weight of the line and you have the, uh, the back cast and the forward cast. The important thing is this um, kind of, you want to keep it between like two o'clock and 10 o'clock. Think of this as a, and then one of the biggest mistakes people will make is they go too far back on the back cast. They'll go to like three o'clock. So the, the rod's almost, you know, parallel to the ground. When that happens, you have no power. The, the line will kind of flop in back of you and then you won't be able to get any oomph behind it going forward. Um, so it's really kind of two pieces to it. You go backwards and then you go forwards. And, um, and well, the, you know, Cecily and I are actually gonna fish on Sunday. So uh, this is where you'll get your hands on it and, and practice that. We'll actually cast on the grass at the park first. And then uh, once you get the, a pretty good hang of it, uh, we'll put a fly on the end of it and try and get a fish to bite it. Nice. Yeah. I'm going to try to get out this weekend too, for the first time. Yeah. And, we had some nice weather coming. Yeah. And I actually was just reading, I, I get a, a fly fisherman magazine that just came today and the guy was just talking about shooting your back cast and shooting your front cast and all that yeah. stuff. So yeah, I've been studying hard today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's a, it's a, you know, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And after a while you'll, the important thing is the, is that load getting that bend in the rod. And uh, once you've done it a while, you actually can feel that in your, your wrist and your forearm. You'll, you'll feel the, you know, there's like a real subtle, and it's, it's muscle memory. It's like uh, any other sport, but um, so, but um, another uh, easy cast too, and, and one that's a lot of times people start with is this one called a roll cast. And that one, you just kind of, um, do what this fellow do you kind of just uh, flip the uh you roll the the uh, fly line using your wrist mostly and um it's kind of a motion like uh, hitting a hitting a, a nail with a hammer it's kind of when you uh you kind of pop your wrist and that uh kind of rolls the uh, the line forward the roll cast is a, is a handy cast if you're in a case where you've got trees and bushes right in back of you like let's say you know there's a bush right here um, if you do a back cast, you're going to catch the bush in back of you. And that's one of the most common things you do is you hook a bush on your back cast, um, or a piece of grass, or, you know, it's amazing, whatever you can catch, you will, uh, it's part of the learning curve, but, um, sometimes you'll be in a situation where you can't make a back cast. So you'll do a roll cast to get your line out. And then some of the other terms, um, or mending, which is a term you do when you're fishing in a stream and stripping, we talked about that. So that's where you're pulling the fly line with your hand. Uh, basically you're retrieving it and you get putting action, making your fly swim by doing that. And another term is called shooting the line. Let me do a, a quick two minute uh, video here. And uh, cause just seeing a diagram, it's kind of hard to picture this. I should have this other one teed up here. Orvis has some great um, stuff online, by the way. They um, actually, let's see. Yeah, I think we're going to actually include some of those on our site, I think, right? Yeah. I'm going to bring up another website here. And let's get that shared. There we go. 
I've spent so much money over the years at Orbis. I, they, unfortunately, they're not a public company because I should own stock in them by now. They're thousands of dollars I've given this company. So, uh, but this is their site, howtoflyfish.orbis.com. Uh, and they have these great uh, video lessons and, and all sorts of things, but I'll go into the one fly casting. And uh, uh, let's see, I gotta do something else so you can hear it. Uh, share computer sound, there we go. So we'll do this, what a fly rod needs to do. Can everyone see this okay? I'm about to start this video. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me know that you can hear it also. Nice scenery. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Casting is one of the great aspects of fly fishing. Many find the rhythmic motion is relaxing and even therapeutic. Like other activities such as golf or tennis, you need to learn the essentials and practice in order to achieve success. But the key is that it's easy to learn. I can't think of a better person to introduce the basics of casting than my friend Pete Kutzer. Pete's an instructor at the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools and has taught thousands of people to cast a fly rod. He truly loves teaching and his enthusiasm is infectious. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. And if you really want to catch fish, the first cast you've got to learn how to do in fly fishing is a reverse double mocha spiral cast. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All fly rods basically need three things in order to, uh, to work. The first thing they need to do is they need to bend. When that rod bends, we call it loaded. It's loaded with energy, essentially. The next thing that rod needs to do is come to a very abrupt stop. That's going to transfer the energy from the rod into the line, getting that line to roll out. When we cast, we need to make this rod bend and stop twice. Bend and stop, bend and stop. Once behind us, and then once again in front of us. The third thing we need to get this fly rod to do is we need to get that rod tip that I'm pointing right at you to move in the straightest line possible. Straight to the back cast and straight to the forward cast. If I get that rod to move straight back and straight forward, the line is going to travel straight back and straight forward. If I travel in an arch, come up then down, up then down, that's going to send that line down into the ground or into the water and down into the bushes behind you. So just think bend and stop, bend and stop, and travel in that nice straight path. Looks easy, doesn't it? <laughs> he always makes it look easy. Yeah, he's a, he does a good job though. Um, so um, did you notice when he was doing that, the, the bending, the loading of the rod, that's the, uh, it's real kind of subtle, but you, you watch it and it kind of, as it goes back, it, it bends and as he forward, you also get the bend. So uh, these are great videos and uh, they're all about a minute or two long, and, uh, but it really gets into, um, um, you know, the basics and then works uh, from there. So, yep. and okay, so what can you catch? Um, this is the whole point. I mean, some people just like to cast, but uh, the point of fishing is to catch fish. So, um, <laughs> So there's um, kind of a short answer. Anything that swims, you can catch fly fishing, generally speaking, unless it's like too deep underwater. But what you want to learn how to catch in the first fish are these little guys called panfish. And uh, these are your sunfish, uh, these fish called crappies. It's real beautiful. Look at the colors on those. And, uh, and perch, which you'll get in a lot of the lakes. And these are really, they're very aggressive fish. I won't say they're dumb, but they're very aggressive. <laughs> and uh, especially sunfish, they'll, uh, about anything that lands in the water, they'll come charging after it. And um, and they put on a heck of a fight. I think ounce for ounce, or it's just a gram for gram, because they, they, they can uh, almost fight harder than, uh, you know, bigger fish. But uh, they're feisty little guys, and um, a lot of fun to catch, and they're, they're the perfect fish to learn how to fish with. So, um, I always 
recommend when you're learning how to do it, find a pond that has uh, these panfish in it or a small lake. And, uh, you know, you want to get that positive reinforcement of your casting and, uh, and actually catch something, fool a fish. And so these are the guys that you want to, um, you know, find some place that has a lot of these panfish. And one thing um, also, um, the older I get, the fewer fish I kill and eat. Um, my theory is there are plenty of fish that are already dead that I can buy in a store, so I don't need to kill fish. Um, but the ones I will tend to harvest are, are these panfish uh, because they, uh, one of their, their kind of niche in the ecosystem is they're also the, uh, the forage for bigger fish a lot of times. So uh, if you uh, harvest them, you're kind of helping uh, keep their population in check. Um, and they, they taste really good, especially perch. They're really one of the best tasting fish there is, these guys right here. Um, so uh, those are your panfish. And those are your kind of your beginners fish. And then uh, step up from there. And a lot of times if you're fishing for panfish, you may uh, get surprised and catch a bass because they, they swim in the same waters. And um, a lot of times bass are uh, they're predators, so they're looking to eat panfish. Too. And so there's two uh, types of bass, uh, and they're both uh, really fun to catch on fly, fly fishing. And that's the uh, largemouth and the smallmouth. Largemouth is this guy here. You can see why it's called that. You can actually put your hand in, <laughs> inside it. I've caught these things so big that you can, you double, you, I can put my fist inside their mouth. And, um, and, uh, and then this is a brown one. That's a smallmouth bass. You can see the head's a little smaller and uh, that's why I was catching these uh, last Friday, and they are really fun. They're really tough fish. Um, they, they have an attitude. <laughs> so, and um, so bass are a lot of fun. They're ambush um, predators. So a lot of times you'll fish uh, towards uh, something like a fallen down tree or uh, you know a big boulder in the weather. So they like to hide behind things and ambush things. So. Um, and um, with bass, they, they taste okay, but uh, kind of the, the ethic is to, uh, in order to help keep fishing uh, um, improve is uh, don't kill everything that's big enough to eat. Uh, and that's the ethic uh, we call catch and release. So uh, basically you take, uh, and so all the, neither of these fish uh, basically took their picture and then let them go. I have more memories out of the pictures than I did out of any meal I would have gotten out of them. So I didn't kill them. I didn't, um, you know, you know, mount them on my wall or anything like that. So, uh, so that's, like I said, I encourage people to uh, catch it and release. And that way uh, someone else can get a chance to catch, uh, you know, this big fish. Uh, the thing when you do catch and release, though, so you want to be careful with the fish. You don't want to over tire them and you want to keep them in the water as much as possible. Like both these pictures, they were there for about a second, you know, just long enough for me to flip a picture on my phone and then uh, back in the water they went. But uh, the bass are, are very plentiful around here and, and they're a lot of fun to catch on fly fishing. And I don't think they're as used to chasing flies as they are other baits. Uh, a lot of, you know, bait fishermen, they're using big rubber worms and all sorts of plugs and contraptions. And so all of a sudden the flies tend to be smaller and uh, it's something different that they're not as used to seeing. So that's what makes them a lot of fun. Did you use streamers last weekend? Yes. Yeah, primarily streamers. Um, now, then, then we have our trout and this is how fly fishing started was uh, with trout fishing. And, uh, and they're just, some of God's most beautiful creatures are trout. Uh, there are three uh, trout that we get around uh, this area. The uh, brook trout, which is this uh, little guy here. Uh, brown trout, which is this one in the middle. And then the rainbow trout, which is the one on the right here with that big bold pink stripe on them. And they're all gorgeous. I mean, they just get this iridescence uh, color to them and uh, they get vari variations in their colors too. Sometimes brown trout will get silvery when you catch them out of a big body of water. Like the ones in Lake Ontario are like bright silver. And when they come into the streams, they actually turn into that kind of gold and brown. So the other three trout, uh, brook trout are actually the native uh, trout in the east. And um, they're, they're kind of canaries in a coal mine. They really are 
will tell you how well an environment is doing because I need very, very cold and very clean water uh, to survive. And most of the brook trout you'll get around here are like about this size, very small little fish, but just brightly colored. Um, in the Adirondacks and uh, New England and into Canada, you'll get bigger and bigger brook trout. Um, and, um, but around here, if you're lucky enough to find them, they're, they're gonna be kind of little guys like this. Brown trout um, are the more common fish and they are uh, very adaptable. They're originally from Europe. Uh, and some people used to call them German brown trout and they've been introduced throughout the world. You can catch brown trout now in uh, New Zealand and they've been introduced to South America, Argentina. Um, and they're a very adaptable. They have a little more um, hardiness than brook trout do. So they can tolerate warmer temperatures and uh, uh, slightly uh, water doesn't have to be as pristine. So they will be the most commonly uh, stocked fish in this area uh, that the DEC puts out are brown trout. Um, and then uh, rainbow trout are the native trout of the West Coast, the Pacific uh, drainage. And, uh, but they've also been stocked uh, around the world. And um, a lot of times uh, rainbow trout are stocked in, um, in the same waters that brown trout are stocked. Um, uh, brown trout are more commonly caught around here, but uh, you'll have rainbow trout in, in the Finger Lakes. Uh, you can get very big ones in, in many of the Finger Lakes too. And they're just gorgeous. I mean, the name of, and the coloration of them is uh, just fantastic. So the key to catching trout is um, presentation and what's called matching the hatch, basically throwing a bug out there that looks like food. And, um, but mostly the most important thing is, is presenting the fly so it, it floats naturally, uh, especially if you float in a stream, you want it to float down the stream so it looks like uh, natural food. And just like bass, uh, we encourage people to catch and release trout. I don't think they taste as good as other fish do anyway. Sometimes they do, but uh, um, I tell people that just so they catch and release. I, it's, <laughs> I had one fellow, he caught one out of Lake Ontario and he said it was just, you know, awful. So um, be, beware of that. So like I said, you can buy fish that are already dead that uh, you don't have, <laughs> have to kill, uh, kill fish. And it's actually a really neat feeling when you get into catching and releasing after you, you catch it and grab a picture and just watch it swim away. It's kind of a nice, uh, nice feeling, nice memory. So those are our three trout. And um, now if you step up a game, and this is what's kind of neat about this area is that we have these really big trout uh, that migrate out of the Great Lakes um, into these uh, tributary streams. And the uh, tributaries in Lake Erie and Ontario uh, are becoming worldwide, like global destinations for, we have fishing tourists that uh, come from around the world to fish in these streams in New York. And um, <clears throat> most of these three uh, fish are actually uh, not native to the Great Lakes. They were introduced um, starting in the 1960s and 70s. They started putting um, uh, salmon in, Pacific salmon. This is a Chinook or King Salmon. And um, so those were, were first introduced and they get huge, uh, very large. And, uh, and that's where, if you were targeting um, uh, King Salmon, you would use like a, a pretty heavy rod, like one of those nine weight rods, because these they, they will break a small rod, they're so strong. And um, the middle fish, this is a, a steelhead trout, which is, um, actually the same genetically as a rainbow trout. It's just a different uh, strain and um, it's a migratory strain. So it's, the difference is a steelhead trout is born in a stream, migrates out to a large body of water, and then uh, will migrate back into the stream to uh, spawn and reproduce. And, um, and that's where you like to uh, catch them is when they're in the, um, in the tributaries uh, that's me in the background. So this is a one I caught um, out of a Lake Erie tributary. And then we also get very large brown trout and the brown trout um, in Lake Ontario in particular, uh, they, which is where this one was from. Um, here again, it's become a, the 
a really a well-known destination for large brown trout in this area. Um, it's equivalent to uh, New Zealand and Argentina are the only other places where you get brown trout as large as we do in this area. So that's pretty neat. Uh, the, and all you catch like a very large fish like that. It's just, it's very memorable. <laughs> uh, as John can attest to us, because he's got mm -hmm. a few of these. Um, mm -hmm. they're just it's, different, it's just a different universe of uh, the strength of these things. And um, the timing of it is uh, most of the, uh, the, the runs of these, uh, the salmon usually start in September. And then it's kind of September through November, um, even into the winter, depending on how harsh the winter is, you can, you can catch these. And then there's also a spring season up till, uh, oh, even about a few weeks ago, you could, you could still get steelhead and, and brown in the tributaries. After the, the streams start to warm up a bit, the fish retreat back into the colder waters of the lake. And, um, um, then you could, you know, you could still fly fish for them if they were close to shore, but for the most part, they're going to be offshore and deeper water. So that's a little different game then. And it's real important here again with these, uh, these are such trophy fish. Um, uh, here again, we want to catch and release. Um, also, there's, I mentioned this, be cautious of consuming. There used to be uh, warnings about eating fish out of the Great Lakes. They'd tell people not to eat more than one meal a day or one meal a day, one meal a month of Great Lakes fish. They've relaxed that a little bit, but there is a legacy of, uh, of pollution in the lakes, of industrial pollution, and especially uh, mercury and, and things like that. So um, if you are eating these fish, you want to uh, trim off the fatty parts of it, which are along the, the belly here. You basically just cut that out and throw it away because that's where they would store, um, you know, heavy metals or things. The older and a fish gets, the more of that kind of stuff will be in their body. So I don't, I personally don't eat fish out of the Great Lakes for the most part. So I've never killed a steelhead or a, a brown out of the lake. So, so these are our, our, our trophies in this area. And, um, and then the last type of fish you can catch are what are called cool water species. And those would be your pike, uh, and pickerels, which are related to each other. This is a, was a gorgeous trip. Uh, this is Seneca Lake in October. It was really beautiful foliage, and I caught this uh, really big wow. pike on uh, fly fishing. Pike are a lot of fun fly fishing. They um, usually use a really big fly. Uh, it's almost the size of a, a panfish, <laughs> and um, and I use a nine weight rod when I'm I'm going after these. And this is a, a, a friend of mine who's a fishing guide out of the Ithaca area. Uh, so we're fishing from a boat, uh, fly fishing from a boat. This was near um, Watkins Glen in the south end of Seneca Lake. Um, so pike and pickerel are, are pretty common in the Finger Lakes and uh, you'll get them um, usually in the cooler times of the year. The fall, you see this is in the fall. Um, they come into shallower water. I didn't have a good walleye picture um, and I've actually never caught a walleye on a fly, but they, they do have the bin here, especially Lake Erie is uh, really well known for walleye and some of the other, um, more of the shallower finger lakes will have them. Um, walleye are one fish I will bend my catch and release uh, rule on because they are delicious. They are <laughs> if you ever travel in, and go to like Minneapolis or uh, Wisconsin up in those states, a lot of times restaurants have walleye on the menu and I, encourage you to order it if you see it because it's, it's really a real nice mm -hmm. uh, white meat really good tasting okay those are some, what you can catch um and then that's just a sample there's some other you can catch things like carp which a lot of people are that's becoming a, a fun sport uh, which is usually considered kind of a rough fish or uh mm -hmm. but they get to be huge sizes and, and some of the biggest freshwater fish you can catch are carp and they're very tricky to catch. They're they're smart and um, and they don't like to be caught. They get they have an attitude also. So here are the bugs. Here are the type of flies we can cut, use. Start to show you some of the baits that we use. So for panfish and bass, uh, a lot of times one of the most effective things are um, these bugs that we call poppers. And these float on the surface, and they have these rubbery legs and and feathers and um, 
And when you cast them, you kind of you do a short strip and make a little pop in the water. And, and a lot of times that will trigger a response from the fish. And you get these in different colors. Uh, yellow, I find, is real effective. Um, black and white and, and so forth. Um, and what you're imitating here is um, really it's like dragonflies. Have you ever noticed on a lake or something way dragonflies will fly around? Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of what these are looking like or frogs, small frogs, those kind of baits um, are what you're imitating with poppers. And um, this white one over here, this is called a woolly bugger. And if you only had one fly to, to use in your life, you would get these. Uh, these are imitating, um, instead of bugs, you're imitating a lot of times minnows or uh, crayfish. And you'll get these in a variety. I have a box that's just in, dedicated to woolly buggers in different colors. And I have them in white and black and olive and chartreuse and brown and yellow. And you, um, so, and depending what color they are, uh, like an olive one is a good imitation for a crayfish. And a white one is a good, uh, or chartreuse is good for uh, imitating a minnow. And uh, really, uh, uh, effective fly and also very simple to make uh, to tie if you you start getting into that. A lot of times these panfish like bright shiny things so this uh, fly here has a bead a brass bead on it and they'll, uh, that'll catch the light especially on a sunny day a, a bead will um, attract fish the reflection of it. So those are poppers and um, now the more traditional uh, trout flies, and one of the most fun thing is, is catching them with a dry fly. And here you're imitating uh, mayflies and um, also what's called caddis flies. And that's what this fly is called a caddis. And this one's um, uh, some type of mayfly imitation. So these are designed to float. And um, so you, you uh, throw the cast out and it's important that they drift on the surface of the water so it looks like a live insect. And uh, the fun part about dry fly fishing is very visual. So you'll actually see a lot of times the fish, if you got your glasses on, you'll see the fish rise up to it and actually take the fly. So it's a, it's a lot of fun to, uh, to, uh, to see it happen. And um, if ever you're on a stream and you're seeing like uh, fish feeding, like coming up to the surface and, and you see those kind of dimples in the water or you hear those splashes, then that's a good sign that fish are feeding on the surface. And then that's when you could try to use a, a dry fly to catch them. This black one here is kind of imitating a beetle. It's what we call a terrestrial fly. And that's actually just made out of a, a foam material and it floats along. And um, so uh, you get all sorts of, uh, you'll get imitations of grasshoppers and ants and, and all sorts of bugs like that. So any uh, bug on the surface, we call a dry fly. And then just under the surface, um, fish actually eat most of their food under the water. And uh, that's where you use what's called a wet fly. And um, these will swim, oh, just a few inches below the water. And what you're trying to get them to do, fool the fish into thinking is that this is a, what's called an emerging insect. And uh, one of the things you become as an entomologist as you do this sport too, and you learn the life cycle of, of bugs especially bugs in water. And um, what they will do is they, uh, they live underwater for most of their life. And I'll go to the next slide here as a larva, and those are called nymphs. So for a mayfly, it'll actually spend, I think it's something like a year or two underwater in this uh, larval stage. And then all of a sudden they get this trigger to, to reproduce and they float to the surface uh, and um, emerge as a adult mayfly. Uh, they fly off and uh, the males and females form these swarms and they uh, mate and then they die. <laughs> and so the lifespan of an adult mayfly is like in, measured in like hours, maybe an hour, <laughs> but it'll spend like all, most of its life underwater. And so a nymph is a fly that's uh, basically you fish it towards the bottom of, of the stream. And um, if you've ever picked up a rock in a stream and turned it over and seen kind of those creepy crawly things, that's what the uh, nymphs are imitating, those little critters that uh, kind of crawl along the bottom. And um, 
And uh, you see a lot of times there's beads on these and they're made out of these kind of fuzzy materials. And some of these get really tiny, uh, like real little, little flies. And then the final category of flies are what we call streamers. And we talked about those. And with streamers, you're not imitating insects, but you're imitating uh, bait fish, minnows. And so uh, that's why, and the important thing when you uh, fly fish with streamers is you have to give some motion to it. If you just throw it out there and let it lie there, it probably won't attract much attention. But uh, you manipulate it in the water by stripping the line or uh, moving the rod tip around just to give the fly some motion, and make it look like a, a living uh, swimming minnow. Here's our woolly bugger again, only this one's in uh, black and, and olive there. So with streamers, uh, you're imitating bait fish and uh, crustaceans and, and so forth. And a lot of times as you go, especially to fish for bigger fish, um, uh, they're not interested in eating bugs so much. When they get really big, uh, they want to eat other fish, including their own. <laughs> they'll, they'll be cannibals and, and so forth. So uh, really larger fish, uh, then you may be uh, using streamers more often. Uh, these uh, Great Lakes fish, I tend to use uh, streamers to fish with. Whereas in smaller streams, you know, use nymphs or wets or dries. Those are your flies. Um, any questions on flies or? No, I don't okay. think so. It's, it's gonna take a while to figure out what they are. Every time I go look at flies, I don't remember their names after I buy them. <laughs> yeah, and um, <laughs> yeah, you can spend a lot on them too and they're about two or three bucks a piece. And, um, and a lot of times people will learn, um, you know, to make their own flies, to tie their own flies. Um, is, that's kind of a popular winter activity. So we're coming up on about an hour and a half now. Um, so I may um, wrap this up uh, before we go too much quicker. How, how is everyone doing with uh, their time? I don't wanna. I'm good. How are you, Sus? I'm fine, thanks. Okay. So we'll really quickly kind of go over where to fish. Um, and this is where I'm gonna take you Sunday, Cecily and uh, Victor Park here, okay. I put John here. And there's this uh, pond, real pretty pond here and um, that the parks department runs. And uh, it's loaded with uh, lots of sunnies. That's what this little girl uh, has caught there. They actually have a, a, a fishing derby for kids uh, there, which is a lot of fun. This girl actually won the, the thing. She caught like 13 fish. <laughs> so oh she was gosh. really, she was really into it. It's very competitive. Um, so we were helping them. Um, they were all, you know, using worms and so forth. But uh, it was a good time. But this is a a, a perfect place to learn how to fish because there are lots of these little guys in uh, in here. And um, one of the uh, benefits I have living in Victor is there's this park, a uh, uh, town park called Bountain Park. Uh, it's about uh, 10 minutes from where I live. Um, it's also called the Fairport Reservoirs. There's these two uh, lakes that used to be the water supply for Fairport. And uh, Victor and East and West Bloomfield bought the two lakes and made a park out of it. And um, so it's open to only residents only. Although anyone can go there, but you can only residents can park there, I should say. So if you're uh, nice to me, I can take you <laughs> to fish in these two two little lakes and they're great. Uh, I, I have a kayak that I take out on on these lakes and um, I'm hoping we can do an event in July um, here. I'm actually in, is asking the parks department if we can have a waiver to have non-residents uh, uh, go and fish and so stay tuned. We might be able to uh, at least get our TU members access to these this park. And then um, Okay, then real quickly, here are some of the streams that you can trout fish in. Um, the, and I'll go through a couple of those. Um, the Cohocton River, this is kind of the home stream of our TU chapter. I don't know if you're aware of where that is, but it's uh, south of uh, the Finger Lakes, basically. Here's Canandaigua Lake and the other small lakes. And uh, as you drive south of Naples, uh, you enter the Cohocton Valley. And the Cohocton, it's a fairly long stream. It flows um, from like Livingston County all the way. Um, it's a tributary of the Shemung River. 
um, and joins it down near Corning, I think. And then uh, it's actually part of the Susquehanna uh, River system. Hmm. So uh, this is uh, one of our closest streams. It's very accessible, it gets a lot of stocked fish. And our chapter is uh, very involved in the conservation projects here. We plant a lot of trees along the bank of the Cohocton River and, uh, and do some other events there. So that's kind of our, um, our uh, home stream to, to babysit with is, I'm actually gonna try and go there either tomorrow or Thursday. It's supposed to be nice weather. I haven't been there yet this year. Um, and this is probably the most popular stream locally, the Owatka Creek, which is in Monroe County, uh, Western Monroe County, it originates near uh, Leroy. And um, it gets a lot of, the only problem with the Awaka, it's very popular because you can see how close it is to Rochester. So a lot of people fish it. There's a, uh, a park there, Monroe County Park, uh, where you can, um, there's a fisherman area. And um, it's a tributary of the uh, Genesee River, Awaka Creek, really beautiful stream. And, uh, but does get a lot of uh, uh, fishing pressure. And, um, Let's see. And then uh, as far as the tributary streams, there's a lot of those that are really good. I'll go through some of these quickly. Um, the uh, one of the closest ones is Arondacoit Creek. This comes out of a uh, flows into Arondacoit Bay and eventually into Lake Ontario. And this is like an urban suburban fishery. Uh, this first map is in there's a park in Penfield. Um, what's the name of it? Ellison Park, I think, or there's a couple of parks that are, you have access to fish. And then um, further up and about in this area is a Powder Mill Park, which is a Monroe County Park, that they have a fish hatchery on the creek. And so they stock uh, brown trout in there. And it's very popular. That's right off of uh, Route 96, Powder Mill Park. It's right around the corner for me, and I go to the fish hatchery pretty often, actually, with my grandkids and so on. Oh, yeah, it's fun. So It's, um, it's really fun. It's really fun. It, it also gets a lot of pressure. Uh, it's very popular. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and it's funny, as the year goes on, they, they, even the little stocked fish get smart. And it gets in, when you fish in September, it's actually pretty hard to catch them. <laughs> and uh, it goes as far up, actually, into Victor. This is the uh, last map. There's a Fisher's Park in Victor. Uh, has access for fishing. Um, so that's a, a rondequoit, real close local stream for us. And then um, one of my favorites, um, John and I have fished in there too, is Sandy Creek, which is also in Monroe County. And that's in um, uh, Hamlin, town of Hamlin. And that's a Lake Ontario tributary. And that's um, where I've caught some of those big uh, brown and steelhead uh, trout there. Really pretty, mostly farmland it goes through, but a really productive stream. And another close Ontario tributary is uh, Oak Orchard, um, which is in Orleans County near uh, Albion. And um, this one is, is very popular. It does, uh, people actually, I've met people from like Ohio and Pennsylvania and all sorts of people drive New Jersey We'll travel long, long distances to, to fish in Oak Orchard Creek. So, um, and finally, this is, um, this is a Lake Erie stream. There's several uh, uh, streams and uh, tributaries of Lake Erie that are really good, but the most famous one is called Cataraugus Creek. Um, it's near uh, Fredonia and Dunkirk, out that way, west of Buffalo. And part of the river is actually in the Seneca Nation. Uh, and you have to have a separate license that you buy from the Senecas. They don't honor, they don't recognize that they're part of New York. So um, you have to buy a special license to fish the, uh, in the uh, Seneca lands. But a lot of it is, is uh, not in there and, and uh, really beautiful area. Um, this area called the Zor Valley is uh, like a big, um, gorge that the stream goes through. All right, so that's some of those. And then uh, as far as warm water, which would be your bass and panfish, there's lots and lots and lots of options. The uh, smaller finger lakes um, uh, like Honey Oy or Hemlock Lakes, um, Canandaigua Lake, uh, those you'll, you'll get more of your warm water fish. Um, 
One of my favorite warm water fisheries I've just discovered is the Canadagua Outlet, uh, which is the uh, tributary coming out of the north end of Canadagua Lake. I found a nice little place to fish in uh, Shortsville on that stream, but primarily uh, bass and, and so forth, not trout so much. And this is uh, Canada's Lake, um, which I haven't caught anything other than panfish in here, but it's a beautiful, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been over to it, uh, these two little lakes, uh, Hemlock and Canada's, but they're totally undeveloped. There's no cottages and they limit the number of boats. Um, you can't, you can only take small, uh, outboard engines, nothing big on there. And um, a lot of people kayak and canoe on the lake and just a gorgeous spot there. One of these days. I'll... My, my favorite hiking trail is Canada Ice Lake. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep, I go hiking there all the time. Yeah, it is gorgeous there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're almost at the end here. So this is kind of a commercial for what TU is. Uh, basically, we're a cold water conservation is our mission. Um, and with uh, climate change and so forth, that uh, is becoming even a more important mission because the trout especially are really, like I said, canaries in the coal mine. If uh, water gets too warm, um, uh, trout cannot survive in, in uh, water, really, I think above about 65 degrees. Is, um, the reason why is there's not as much dissolved oxygen in um, warmer water as there is in cold water. And, and, and so trout require more oxygen and so they have to have cold water to survive. Where we are is kind of almost the boundary between cold and warm water fishing, which is nice that we have both kinds of fish, um, but we're almost on the kind of the southern edge of, of where trout can even survive. Um, some of the mountainous regions in like Pennsylvania also are good trout fishing, but um, for the most part, you go the much farther south than us and then you're getting into more warm water fishing. All right, and, um, and then this is our chapter. Um, we're, um, and this is the, uh, what our new website's gonna look like, which John is actually working on so, for us. I, and he did this uh, logo for us, nice view of Canada. It's very attractive, nice, nice logo. Yeah, he did a great job there. Okay, so um, let me uh, turn off the recording.